Welcome, welcome, welcome to The Living Room, where we listen, learn, and live together. I'm your host, Richard Martin, and I'm so grateful for your presence and your engagement. As you can see, I am recording live from a different setting than normal. I am home. By home, I mean my parents' home, my sister. I'm with family for this recording. Behind me, you've got my father's car collection. We've got the books from childhood, pictures from childhood. And as I've been here, I've had the chance to go down memory lane. My mother put in front of me when I arrived, a big photo album filled with childhood photos. And let me tell you what, your boy has come a long way when it comes to fashion and style. So have you ever had that experience before I asked my parents, yo, what were you thinking? Those colors don't match. That doesn't go together. But then honestly, some things I'm saying, you know what? I need to bring that back. I need to find an adult size version of that outfit. Well, listen, even if you don't consider yourself to be fashion forward, if you don't feel like you have a sense of style at all, you just dress for comfort. I want you to lean in and listen up because our special guest today has something that you need to hear. His name is Derek Ramey Jr. He is the CEO founder and chief designer of the Dapper Dude Collection based in Huntsville, Alabama. I've been tracking his growth, following him for some time now, and it's my honor, and I'm excited to welcome to the living room, Mr. Derek Ramey Jr. What's up, man? What's going on, man? How you doing, man? I'm excited to be here. I'm doing fantastic. It's good to see you. Good to have you with us. Um, so first and foremost, man, I just want to ask you, how are you doing? How's your family? There's a lot been going on this year. How are you all faring? Uh, so doing awesome, man. Absolutely no complaints. Um, God has been actually blessing like more than he ever has in, in the past, man. Like it's, it's been an amazing year considering, you know, but um, I have no complaints. Family's doing well. Everybody's healthy. Um, and, and we're rolling with it, man. Just taking it in stride and, and, and just trusting, man. I'm glad to hear. So as viewers can see, um, you have a sense of style. I see you with the yellow blazer, man. You've got the scully on, the wonderful frames. But I want to hear from you as we start off this conversation. So when I say style, I mean one thing. When someone says style, they mean another thing. But for you, what is your definition of style? Um, so so you, you really said it, man. Um, so when one person says style, another person says style, a lot of times they're meeting different things. But that's really what style is. It's what makes you happy, what makes mm -hmm. you comfortable. Um, when you put it on, are you like, yeah, I like this, you know? And I always tell people when you when you see it and you see it on and you're happy about it, that style, like that is your style. Um, and trying to, I guess, do what others are doing, I feel like that's not necessarily style. I feel like that's when you're just mimicking, but style is mm -hmm. when you kind of make things your own. I love that um, because I know for me, I've been guilty, I'll be honest, of doing the latter, looking to my left, looking to my right and seeing what someone else is doing, how it falls on them, whether it's shoes, clothes. Um, I don't wear glasses at this point in my life, yeah. but even I'm looking at people who do and I'm saying, yo, yeah. if I did, I want to rock those. So I appreciate That's you true. having that point of clarity to say, you know, if you feel comfortable with it, um, if you like it, then that is style. So I kind of shared a brief snapshot of looking back at old childhood photos. Have you ever mm -hmm. had that experience where you look back at childhood photos and you say to yourself, guys, what were you all doing to me? Yeah, yeah. Uh, ab absolutely, man. Um, I think the 90s were kind of rough for me, man. Uh, and, and, and it was more so just that the things were too big for me. Um, the, the style of it wasn't so bad. Um, I've always been kind of eclectic. And my parents actually did a pretty good job of, of keeping us kind of stylish. Um, but yeah, I, I wore a lot of things that were just way oversized. I could fit like three people in it, you know. <laughs> so so I, I think that's the biggest misstep that I had growing up um, was just things were just way too big. You and I both. So right now I wear a 40 long suit jacket. And I'm sure I've been a 40 long for a long time, but I have not always <laughs> a 40 long. When I look at high school photos, even I would say as, as recent as freshman, sophomore year in college, man, I was rocking 42s, 44 longs. Great, long. great. You yeah. know, I'm a 15 and a half collar in terms of yeah. dress shirt, but I remember wearing 16 and a half and you can see the collar droop. Yeah. <laughs> Understood, man. So I, I feel you. I think you grow into it. You learn things. Exactly. Um, 
looking at other people isn't always bad so far as education. You know, Absolutely. it wasn't until I saw somebody with a, not even just a bespoke suit, but tailored, mm -hmm. it fit their frame, their Absolutely. form. But I said, yo, how did you get this look? And they helped me to say, your clothes are too big. So yeah. I appreciate you being candid enough and honest enough to say, <laughs> yeah. what you see right now, it hasn't always been. So when you started off, well, let me just ask you this, at what point did the turn or transition happen for you personally, when you start to say, okay, I want clothes that fit me. Right. Um, and you mentioned that you already, you always kind of had maybe an eclectic sense of style. When did things come together for you personally to say, hey, I know who I am, I know what I want to wear, and that's what I'm going to pursue? Um, I don't, so I'll say it really was maybe about 17, and I'm, I'm old, it's about 17 years ago. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> About 17 years ago, it, it kind of clicked. Um, like I would be wearing the suits and I was cool with it. I thought I was doing something right. But like you said, it's okay to kind of see other people wearing things and say, okay, so I like how that looks. How does that translate for me? Mm. So I, I think about like maybe 17 or so years ago, I, I made the transition to finding a tailor and actually getting the clothes uh, tailored to fit me. Sure. So um, I, I think once I did that one time and I kind of felt how it felt to, to, be, to be in those clothes. Oh yeah. It's like, ah, I think I like this. I, I like this uh, vein that I'm, that I'm going in. You know, it's many, funny you mentioned, I like how it felt. Um, I didn't always get that connection either between mm -hmm. what one wears and how it feels um, until the same similar situation as you when I actually had the chance to wear something that, that fit nicely I was able to then compare it to say, you know, all these years I have felt like these clothes were big. I, I have seen right. my pant legs um, gathering at the bottom there, right. but yeah, yeah. I just have known better. And, you and didn't to know some better. Degree, right. I think a lot of things are, are caught even as much as they are taught. So Absolutely. if someone, you know, never comes along and taps you on the shoulder, just comes alongside of you and said, hey, you know, we can, we can hem your pants or we can kind of tailor the, the width of it all. Now, I will say this, there was a season where a lot of things that I look back on were stylistic. I'll take, Absolutely. for instance, Steve Harvey. And you've yes. seen the side-by-sides of Steve. There yeah. was a time where the wide leg suit pants, the eight button jacket, that was actually a thing. 30 button jacket, yeah. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was a thing, you're right. You know? And, and you, so and now and you see them two button. Yeah. No, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, I was, I was gonna say, you, you're right. Like the 30 button suits was a thing and, and people rock it like, like this is it. And like, it was never gonna go out of style. And I guess as you see how it actually makes you look, you're like, okay, I think I need to kind of change that up a little bit. Cause that, that just wasn't right. And, and people are still rocking some of that stuff too. Cause once you get locked in, into a certain thing, you feel like you were cool in that era. So you have to also be willing, willing to change, willing to kind of wow. make the updates as well. Like that's a that's a big part of it as well. Speaking of eras, has there is there I should say a fashion era slash decade that you feel like, man, I should have been living during this time, or I wish I were an adult during this era. And the second part of my question is whether or not there is, is there a certain fashion era or decade that you seek to infuse in your own personal approach to style and even what you create for others? Um so I love the '60s, man. Mm -hmm. um, I, I love the mod kind of kind of look. Sure. Um, it it was very tailored, um, in my opinion. Um, so yeah, the, the '60s was big for me. I, actually, a lot of things that I collect are from the '60s. Like I, I love that era, wow. um, as far as fashion and everything goes. Um, I I love the '70s too. I love the '70s because um, they kind of played with a lot of uh, different fabrics, a lot mm. of patterns. Um, they they weren't afraid to kind of play around with, with a lot of things, man. So I think those eras are the ones that I usually infuse the most, but I try not to limit myself. Okay. Um, if I see something from any other era that looks cool, how do I make that uh, modern or for modern times? So um, you'll you'll see me wearing like any anything from the 20s yeah. on up to, I think I, think I usually stop around early. <laughs> Early 80s, 90s weren't that great for me. I wasn't, wasn't too happy with that. But, you know, around the 80s is probably where I'll stop. Sure. Man. 
I saw, in fact, it was a newspaper clipping from the early 80s when my mm -hmm. father, he was probably maybe my age or a little younger, late 20s. And I was taken aback. Yo, my father was in a two button double breast, right? There so we go. normally mm -hmm. think of maybe a four button or a six button, mm -hmm. but it was a two button double breast, um, thin lapels, peak lapel, mm -hmm. um, yep. a nice, so I think now kind of a lot of us really like the spread collar. But mm -hmm. then it was kind of more of the poplar collar and a skinny tie. Yep. And I said, Dad, you know, where is this suit? This right. suit, I could wear this right now. <laughs> right, 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 right. You know? Absolutely. So do you think then that there is kind of a cycle to fashion, a cycle to style? Man, absolutely, man. Um, like they always say, there's nothing new under the sun. This stuff mm -hmm. always cycles back and people feel like they're doing something new but it, it's all the same just with a twist so if, sure. if you can realize that you're really always going to be in style um and mm. you just kind of have to figure out how to how to make what you're wearing timeless if, if you can do that man like it doesn't matter wow. what area you're in like it's you're gonna you're gonna flow through them all and yeah. you're gonna add the different things from the different eras like um you, you're gonna add like whatever you need from that era to make it look modern but mm -hmm. you're always going to be in style, man. Like just figure That's, out how to make it timeless. That is a profound thought. Figure out how to make what you're wearing timeless. I've heard others who probably have a greater sartorial sense than I do. They have said that when you make investments, sometimes people can really take the economic approach. And I think there's a place for that, right? Like everything yeah, doesn't have to be top dollar in order absolutely. for it to be high quality, in order for it to last long. But then there are certain items that you will probably want to invest in and you can either look at it like, oh, well, you know, I, I'm not going to pay that much. Or you can right. look at it as an investment to say, these shoes that I'm going to purchase in 2020, I'm going to be wearing for the next 20 years, as Absolutely. opposed to buying 20 pairs of shoes <laughs> over the next right. 20 years, right? Absolutely. And so what is your thought on that, you know, investment in high quality or long lasting items versus mm -hmm. just taking the economic approach? When you are interacting with clients or even just friends who say, hey, yo, Derek, man, I need to run something by you. What is your advice and your perspective? Um, so I think this will make sense. Um, I always tell people to kind of understand what they're going for with their closet. So if you're trying to have a certain look, you need to focus on items that are going to make a statement and that are going to complement. So, wow. so you're going to have big pieces. So, so say if you have like a nice overcoat, that's going to be your statement piece because that's the main thing that people are going to see. But then what are going to be some things under there that plays the role of complimenting mm. so it's always you're always trying to um to do a balancing act if something is bold then you're going to have to go um less bold on the other items so just focus on things that kind of make you have a cohesive closet so that you're not thinking about it or overthinking uh what you're wearing every day so i so say like this jacket right here I'm, it's yellow it's loud so I know I can throw something nice and simple up under there and I can walk out of the house and it's going to look good every time. So just mm -hmm. make sure you're thinking balance in your mind every time that you're, you're picking clothes. What are things that I know I can easily throw on and always, and I'm always going to look good. So that's, that's usually so speaking how I of, Speaking of complimenting your closet with something that is convenient, something that compliments you. Mm -hmm. um, there are, there are a few So, we're in a changing, let me, let me approach it like this. We are in a changing season. Mm -hmm. Summer's over, we're in fall, we're coming toward winter. I personally, I actually like winter. I like the layering options that Love you it, have. Man. You're able to, oh, it's, it's, it's beautiful to me. Not only can you be warm, but you have a chance to kind of diversify. Do you have a, pr a preferred season that you like to dress in personally? And then the second thing I wanna throw at you is I think for somebody listening and perhaps somebody watching as well, they have felt this sense of, well, my frame does not allow me to, mm -hmm. I am not a canvas for anything stylish. Maybe I'm too thin, I'm too tall, I'm too wide, I'm too short. You interact with a lot of different clients so far as they present physically. So when it comes right. to a person's anatomy, their frame, how do you help them to say, listen, I don't want you to stop thinking about Terry Crews, Dwayne yeah. Johnson, Absolutely. You know, Serena Williams and Halle Berry. I need you to think about yourself. So you can kind of come at both of those any, any way you want to. The first is, do you have a preferred season that you like to dress in? And then how do you help people overcome 
the self-consciousness that says, man, nothing can be done to help me. Absolutely. Um, so uh, the first question, I love winter, man. Like just, just like you, man, I love it when it gets cold. I love when I'm able to kind of layer and I always say in the summer, you can only take so many clothes off, man. Like, right. <laughs> like in the winter, you can add things. You can take stuff off if you need, just wear like a, a sweater or a turtleneck and all that type of stuff. So I think there are a lot more options in the winter. Mm -hmm. So that's that's definitely my favorite, man. I think I get sad when, when the summer <laughs> comes a little bit, man, because I'm like, eh, I just, you know, I'll, I'll wear some stuff, but it's not exciting or anything like sure. that uh, for me. Um, as far as body types and kind of helping people to have confidence in, in what they're gonna wear. Um, like you said, I always tell them to not necessarily look at specific people mm -hmm. um, because you're never gonna look like the next person. We can wear the exact same um, outfit. It's always gonna look different um, on a standing side by side. It's cause it's always about the confidence that you have in what you're wearing. Mm. So that's what we have to do. We have to find what makes us happy. Like back to, yeah. back to that part. You got to find what makes you happy and what makes you comfortable. And really what it comes down to is, is the fit. You, you got to invest in making sure things fit you, you correctly. Um, so if you need to buy something a little bigger so that you can tailor it down to your size so that it cool. fits you, you start there. Um, you can make these garments look how you want it to look. Um, and you just have to be okay with doing putting a little work in. Okay. Like people want to pull it off the rack and expect that it's gonna fit. But they have to make these garments for thousands of people, like many millions of people really, right? So the odds that it's gonna fit everyone, everyone's body body type right off the rack is is very low and it's discouraging to people if they don't know that you can actually go and do a little work um, and, and make it fit you. So that's, that's usually where I start. That's very helpful. I'm telling you, man, this conversation for me is more than just contemporary. It's also biographical because as you're sharing, I wish I had a great deal of this coming up. I'll give a few examples to illustrate what I mean. Anytime new Jordans drop, you know, out of 10 people, yeah. you know, eight of them are gonna be wearing the same shoe, right? Absolutely. And it wasn't until my favorite pair of Jordans are the Jordan threes. For whatever reason, those are just, those are my number ones, right? Yeah. So I remember when they came out, the retro versions, I was at Oakwood mm -hmm. in college and literally it was a, it was an eye opening experience. So I was in college. I didn't have it with college money. I didn't get the Jordan threes, <laughs> but a lot of my friends, a lot of my college buddies, they had them. And then I noticed almost every other person that I saw was wearing them. Mm -hmm. And I still like them. If I were able to afford them, I'm sure I would have been a part of that group that had them. I'm not saying that that, that was a bad thing, but what it Absolutely. did for me was it helped me to understand that, you know what, I need to ask myself, am I wearing things just because they're trending, because they're mm -hmm. available, because they make a certain kind of statement? I think everything makes a statement, but Absolutely. what kind of statement do I want to make? When I am seen wearing the Jordan 3s, right. why does that fill me with a certain level of confidence that I don't have or I might right. not have when I'm not wearing a Jordan 3? So my question is, what do you think lends to a certain sense of confidence that a person has based on what they wear? And balance that with me, if you would, with how can I maintain that confidence when I'm not in those clothes? So it's the whole, do the clothes make the person or does the person make the clothes question? Um, so say the first question for me again. Sure, so, so the first part is sometimes when I put on a, a tailored suit, mm -hmm. there's a certain level of confidence that I feel when I walk outside of my home, whether I'm at church, whether I'm in a meeting, yeah. I can just be in the mall. You know, when you have on a nice suit, you're, you're walking like on cloud nine, right? Absolutely. But there are some times where I battle with insecurities or just kind of a decline in that mm -hmm. same level of confidence when the clothes are off. So I'm trying to get a sense of how can we help people who feel like, man, if I don't have the Jordan 3s, illustratively right, right, speaking, right, 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 right. then I really can't play basketball or I'm, or I'm not yeah. in. So I think there's a balance. Yes, clothes bring some level of confidence, yeah. but I don't know if they should be all that makes us confident in terms of our approach to life. So how do you balance that? Man, you, you, you really have to ask that question for, for yourself. Um, 
like why are these clothes making me happy is is it really about the clothes mm. um and really nine times out of ten of course it isn't mm. um and i i think that the different brands and having different brands connect you to people mm -hmm. um because we know if you see the jordan you're like oh man you got those jays <laughs> you know kind of thing so it's 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 a conversation starter it's you you know how much somebody paid for it so it, in people's mind, it's kind of like a, um, like put you in different classes of what you can afford and all that type of stuff. Sure. So it's, it's more so, okay, so for me, I, I know I am a brand, but I don't necessarily care about brands. Okay. If, if I like it, I like it. If I don't like it, it's not because it's a brand, it's because I feel like that's going to be beneficial to what I'm wearing mm -hmm. and not necessarily because it's a specific brand. But I think that it's it's recognition, it's it's connectivity. That's what makes people kind of gravitate to uh, certain brands based on the status that it brings. Um, if we can sure. wipe that away and just kind of like things based off of this is why I like it, this is why I, I love it, then I, I think that you can be the person that is wearing the clothes and not having the clothes wear you, you know, kind of thing. So that's, and that's usually how I, I go about it. No, that is very helpful on a personal level. And I'm sure that um, listeners would say the same. I'll never forget coming up through college. There was, he's actually a friend of mine and he maintained the same sense of style throughout college, mm -hmm. right? And it wasn't necessarily fashion forward. In fact, it really wasn't trendy. Um, it was kind of predictable. He had his own kind of uniform. Yep. And we had so much respect for him because he didn't change or shift with the wind. He yeah. was like, this is what makes me comfortable. This is what makes me happy. And I'm good with that. And even in, in observing him, I'll tell you somebody else who helped me recently, uh, it, former NFL player, Chad Johnson, Chad Ochocinco. I mm -hmm. recently heard a clip of him and he was talking about how people were very surprised when he revealed that a lot of the jewelry that he wore, he would not pay hundreds of thousands of dollars for. Now, this is a professional athlete yeah, yeah. Um, whose salaries are very public. So people know that he, he right. makes a lot of money. But um, he would even say, and, and kind of say it almost, you know, gregariously, mm -hmm. that sometimes he would get certain jewelry items, jewelry items from Claire's, right? The little yeah. small teenage girl boutique shop. Um, and so people were like, what are you making all this money? And he was like, why? What's the point? Why do I need to pay $57,000 for a watch? And the person that was interviewing him, he said to that person, he said, what time is it? And the person told him what time it was. And he was like, see, that was free. It didn't cost me anything to ask you yeah. how, what time it was for you to respond. So I'm going to have $57,000 timepiece on my wrist when I can pay $57, right? Yeah. And, and sometimes the same response is going gonna to come. Oh, man, yeah. check that out, right? Yeah. And so that was kind of a, a perspective shifter for me as well. So you mentioned you are a brand, right? Um, yes. And you are the CEO, the founder, the chief designer of the Dapper Dude Collection, when 17 years ago, things started to come together for you personally, clothes started to fit and feel differently. Was that the time where you said, all right, bet, I'm going to school for fashion and one day I'm gonna own my own company. I'm gonna have my own brand. Tell us the story of how we arrive here with the Dapper Do collection based on what may or may not have been the journey. Was yeah. it that predictable or was it like, brother, not at all? Man. Absolutely not at all. <laughs> not at all. Like I, I had no, no vision of doing any of this um, at all. Um, let's see. About in two thousand and seven, eight. I think that was the last year I worked there. But I was a manufacturing engineer for like seven, seven or so years, seven or eight years. Okay. And I would, I would dress up, you know, all that type of stuff. But I had no idea that I would be making things for people or providing clothing or styling help for for anyone. I was sitting behind a desk making cables, um, reading schematics and all that type of stuff, man. Um, and I think what kind of spurred it, um, so the company started officially in 2013. Mm -hmm. um, what spurred it was, um, I had a friend of mine show me how to make a bow tie. I started out as, as a bow tie company or show me how to tie a bow tie. Um, and then I couldn't find the ones that I wanted for myself after I got into actually wearing them. So I was like, man, let me go ahead and take one apart and try to figure out if I can make it. So wow. I made myself um, a bow tie from one from a thrift store. 
And um, and yeah, so I just started making them and wearing them. And people were like, man, where you get your bow ties and stuff from? So I, I made it. They're like, can you make me one? You know, you know that that kind of situation. So um, as people, more people started asking, I was like, well, I guess I'll go ahead and put it up on Instagram. You know, <laughs> like I'm very, I kind of go with the flow kind of thing, man. Sure. Um, I, I do plan, but I like to kind of go with the flow and kind of listen to where God tells me to go. And I, I'll follow and I, it makes it a lot easier on me because I'm not having to make the decisions based off of, um, well, I can let him make the decisions and then I can just follow where he tells me to go. Sure. So it makes it a lot easier. Um, but yeah, so I started making the bow ties for people and it just kind of, it just kind of went crazy really, really <laughs> fast, man. Like I really can't call it. I'm not sure other than God, you know, how it happened, but um, that just turned into, to, to this man. That's, that's pretty much the beginning of how it started. So a personal passion or maybe even a personal hobby, just something to it, make it was a hobby. Own life. It yeah. transitioned now into attention starting with friends. And you said it happened kind of quickly. Was that just by way of word of mouth? Somebody was wearing it in a different place and uh, an athlete or an actor or somebody said, hey, where's that from? And that was the plug. How did things kind of snowball for you? So the first actual um, order that I did was for a quartet group here locally. Um, so I made like seven, like seven bow ties for them. And, um, like I, I always tell people, man, those, they were, they were kind of trash. I wouldn't, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not sure how they slipped by, but you know, but it was, it was a confidence builder because cool. it was like, you know, okay, well, I guess I, I can make these for people. Um, and as I, I posted it online, which of course, IG has been a, a, a major help for me. Um, sure. my, my first major the first major person that contacted me was um david hollister and he was like hey man i like what you're doing um i'd like to buy some of your pieces and that's rare because most celebrities just be like hey man let me get that stuff you know from you right um, you know which is fine because it's, it's an exchange um but yeah he like he offered to purchase he he bought like wow. maybe 15 15 or 20 bow ties like and a, a few pins um, and I added the pins actually after the bow ties because I needed something to kind of, you know, go with it as a as a combo. Sure. And the pins actually took took off way faster than than the bow ties, which was weird to me. But you know, I went ahead and went with it, man. So yeah. that was that was the first guy that kind of reached out and kind of helped me kind of get on the map, so to speak. Sure. It's interesting. I'm glad you provided that chronological clarification because I actually thought that it was the reverse that the yeah. pins were kind of what kind of push things and then later you brought the bow ties out. But man, I'm glad that you, again, shared with us that when you look back, the first order that you sent out compared to now, yeah. you're saying, uh, I yeah. can relate to that from at least the sermonic standpoint, right? So as a pastor, as a preacher, I listen back to some of my, um, I guess, early sermons yeah. <laughs> as a team sure. and not even just content, right? Because for the most part, you know, I'm trying my best to tell this Bible story. So the Bible story is still the same. Right. But but primarily, and man, my wife, she laughs at me like nobody's business. My Understood. gestures, my gesticulations, I, you know, I'm trying to really do my best. Essentially, you know, I'm not trained. I don't have any formal preparation. So I'm trying to just gra grab on and draw from all right. of my favorite, favorite preachers. And Absolutely. this is what you're going to see in here, right? So I think for those, whether, whether or not a person is thinking, okay, I wanna go into style and fashion, or I wanna go into pastoral ministry, whatever you are doing, it's okay to look back at the beginning stages and say, I've come a, I've come a long way. I think that's a Growth. part of it. Growth, yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Like, and I, I know that I am still growing now. Um, like mm. if, if you decide that you are gonna be stuck at a certain point, you're technically dead. If you're growing, if if you're alive, like you're growing, like, like plants grow, like they never stop growing. Once mm -hmm. they're dead, I, like that's it. So they're not growing mm -hmm. anymore. So for me, growth is something that I always want because I don't want the passion and everything to die. Like I, mm -hmm. I want to always be growing and always be expanding. You know? So that that's where I'm with it, man. I don't ever want to be stuck in a specific yeah. time, era, whatever. I don't I don't want to be stuck. I want to always be growing. 
That's another profound one, man, that in order for the passion to remain alive, I must continue to grow. I think that that translates and can be applied in any area. I mean, both of us are husbands, we have families, Mm -hmm. and I would hate for the day to come where we say, you know what, I think I've reached, you know, my Mm -hmm. peak as a husband. I'm just going to stay here. (laughs) It's not going to last. It's not going to work. (laughs) Yeah. Let me ask you this. I I was preparing to ask this question, honestly, later on down the line, but I'll ask it now. Speaking of family, and um, I didn't, I didn't send you this one in advance on purpose because I didn't want you to have, I didn't want you to think about it. All right. No problem. So if you had to describe your fam- your approach to family as a husband and as a father using fabric language okay right what fabrics what fabrics are you trying to apply to your family right now um, to create values to nurture and that can be as a husband as a father or both if you were to use the language of fabric what are you drawing upon right now? And what are you trying to instill based on what you're drawing upon as a family man? Man, that's a, that's a, that's a loaded one, man. That's a loaded <laughs> Oh, man. Um, I'm, so the first thing that comes to mind is silk. And I feel like silk is a good representation because it's soft, it's smooth. Like, mm. it, you know, it kind of goes with, with the waves. And, and you kind of have to be like that. You, you can't be all rough. Like you have to, right? Like you yeah. have to, 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 to be soft, um, but, but you still are covering, you know? Mm-hmm. So I, I think that still kind of represents um, what the approach that I would like to take. I don't always do that, but, mm-hmm. um, but I would like to take kind of the silky approach because it's, it's soft, it's comforting, it's, it's good to the touch, you know? Yeah. Um, and that's what people, like that's what people need that's what people a lot of times respond to um but you always know that you're 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 covered and warm yeah i love it that's that's excellent man and hey man that was a good question (laughs) yeah man um so when you create your pieces for people whether it's pins bow ties um what inspirations are you drawing from what just inspires you in general when it comes to creating Man, um, I think that I love uh, marrying colors and and just I don't know, just something that that's, that's always gonna allow you to uh, complement your outfit very well. So whether it's a bold color or a geometric pattern on, on a bow tie or a tie, um, I, and I also like simple things because um, I believe that the god of your things it's kind of like you're, you're you're trying to do too much mm-hmm. so I, I like things that so like if i had this on i usually have like a, a real simple circle okay but it's a complimenting color it's not doing too much but you you'll turn and be like oh that's, that's kind of nice I, I want people to be able to look at something and kind of give a double take and not sure. be like oh yeah i saw that coming you know kind of thing so my inspiration is more so a, a subtle one I like things to be organic. Um, and I think I always draw from architecture. I like, I love architecture. I love, I love paintings. I love art, you know, cool. so that's, that's a lot of times what I'm drawing from. So you come from a family of creatives. I went to school with your brothers. Um, I know them for the most part as musicians. Did mm-hmm. you catch that wave as well? Is there a musical strand that you flow from? Or are you more like they did that, I do this? So yeah, man, um, I'm, I'm the old one out, man. So, um, <laughs> so I actually, I play the drums and I play mm-hmm. the lead guitar. Um, now they're, they are way better than me, um, but, <laughs> but I, I, do, I, do play, um, I do play the drums and, and the guitar. I've been playing the drums since I was three and mm-hmm. the gu- guitar since I was 30, so, so. Did you all get that from a, a relative, a church member, a family friend? How did you all get into music? So um, I know on the on the Ramey side, um, like pretty much everybody does something musically. My dad, he plays the bass. Okay. Um, so I guess for all the for, for all the Adventist people out there, if you remember Special Blend, my yep. dad was the one playing the bass on there. Um, wow. Okay. Yeah. 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 So yeah. like, so we got it kind of honest. My mom sings. Um, they had a group at Oakwood. Um, uh, I think 
think it was called like Omega or something like that. They had a little 45 that they did a record <laughs> and everything. Um, so yeah, pretty much everyone in my family either sings or, or plays the instrument. Okay. Yeah. So I want to go back because you said something and I don't want to overlook it. When you mm-hmm. began to transition from, hey, I just want to wear things that I like to people gaining, to people giving you attention, mm-hmm. you went with the flow and said, okay, let's start with Instagram. That grew. You got some, a wonderful opportunity to support a quartet in Huntsville. Then David Hollister reaches out to you and the rest is history, right? But initially what came to my mind, I didn't even think about this. You're the one who, is, who has to make these. You know what I mean? You are the yes, producer. You're, 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 you're the one at the sewing machine. You're going to get the fabric. You're in dialogue. You are essentially the business. Absolutely. Help us with that because I'm sure there are persons who are listening and we see the current picture. We see, we see the curated uh, website. We see the Instagram page. And there's a lot based on what we can see that we can assume, but there's so much that we don't see. We don't see the, 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 the late nights. We don't see yeah, the yeah. mad dashes to the fabric store. We don't see the, what do you mean you don't have any more of this? All yeah. of that. So what was that like initially having to match demand with supply? At what point do you expand your team? And I'm not assuming that this is now like a 200 man or woman operation, but yeah. at what point do you say, okay, if I'm gonna do this, well, I need at least one other person to do that. Help us out with that journey. Man, yeah, that's, that's so making everything um, definitely wasn't something that I was, uh, that I was thinking that I was gonna be doing. Um, but I, I do like to have my hands on the things that I'm providing for people because I wanna make sure they're getting a quality product. I wanna make sure, um, people can, can, can feel your love like when you're, uh, mm. when you're making things for them. So I, I think that is more, um, that's the gratification in it for me. Like sure. I get to make something for you and I am giving you literally a piece of me because creative mm. creativity, it, it comes from you. It comes out through your hands and then it goes on to the person. Mm. Um, so I, I think that that is what has kept me going for this long. So it's really still just me. My wife helps me, um, okay. but it, it's just me um, cranking out the pieces as best as I can. Okay. Um, you know, and, and, it's become like I've become a machine by now, you know. So it's like <laughs> you, you asked me to make a bow tie, I can technically technically make one in probably like ten minutes, you know, kind of sure. thing, and kind of knock it knock it out. Um, and then I'll just kind of create a um, like a, a big inventory for myself, so that I have the stuff available uh, for people to to get if need be. If I feel like sure. you know I'll get behind on it or kind of like that, man. So, but I am working on having a team now because. <laughs> I'm not gonna say it's getting old, but it's getting old. Like, and it's getting bigger. It's growing. Sure, sure. So it's it's for for me to be able to to scale up and and grow myself, I will need to have actually an actual team of people that can sew. And that's the hard part: finding people that you can trust uh, with what's going on in your head. Because mm-hmm. it's not that they can't do it, but it's a matter of getting it out of here so that they can um, so that they can create what you're what you're trying to uh, get across. Kind of thing. And, and it ends up being a situation where you're like, I'll just do it, you know, and just be done with it. But that's not the yeah. smart route to go. If anyone's listening, if you can get help and you can be comfortable having help, definitely start that out in the beginning if you can, because it's hard to go back and do it, or harder to go back and do it. So, man, Dapper Dude, the Dapper Dude collection is still on Instagram. There's still a website. Absolutely. But if I'm not mistaken, there's also now an actual physical brick and mortar that people can visit. Is that true? And if that so, true, man. oh, okay, cool, cool. So, That's so true. when a person walks into the Dapper Dude collection, what is the customer experience like? How are you trying to move from Instagram website to now? Hey, we're breathing the same air. We're sharing time and space. What is the experience like for a customer when they come into the Dapper Dude collection? So, um, so it's changed a little bit because of, of, of COVID and all that type of stuff. Um, so it's, it's not as much seating as, as it used to be, but when, when people come in, um, you can kind of come in and sit and chill, kind of sit into the vibe, get into the vibe. How I have it kind of set up is kind of like a little loft kind of, mm-hmm. um, kind of, kind of area. Um, and I just want people to feel like, Hey, you can sit and talk to me and you can ask me questions about, um, some things that you may be uncomfortable about. 
And that's what I'm there for. I'm, I'm there to kind of help you gain that confidence. Um, and the fact that we are breathing the same air, you can see, I guess, the passion that I have of trying to make sure you look good, like right then and there. And it's, it's a whole lot, um, I guess, feeling that energy. Yeah. Like, like people could respond to that. And I think that was the main reason why I have the space because I don't necessarily need it um, as far as business goes. Um, mm -hmm. Cause a lot of people are getting away from the brick and mortar, right? Um, but to have the person that is making your pieces, um, like you can physically talk to them, like it, it does something for, for you and your relationship with, with the customer. So that's basically what it is, man. Like you can come in, we can do consultations, sit right there back and forth. You can ask whatever questions you need to ask. And it's not a situation where I'm trying to rush you out the door. Like we're coming in to kind of just have that conversation so that, so that sure. you can feel comfortable with the person that you're dealing with. Sure. So I've heard before that whenever a person launches a business and we'll locate this in the context of what it is that you do, the service that you provide as yeah. a business owner, but then also as one who helps people in the area of fashion and style, mm -hmm. that whenever I have a business, it is both inspiration and aspiration. That is to say that a large part of what I'm providing comes from my own journey. It comes from mm -hmm. where I am right now, but there's also a component of it that has to do with where I'm trying to go. You mm -hmm. know, that this is also me on a journey with you. So you've helped us out to a great degree with, okay, here's where I was in the past. Here's mm -hmm. how I have arrived at this point. That's inspiration. So for Derek Ramey Jr., what are the aspirations of the Dapper Dude in terms of the business? Where mm -hmm. do you see it in a year? Where do you see it in 10 years? But then for the man behind the brand, what is this doing for you aspirationally? What is it that gets you up every morning that is, I guess, transformative for you? How yeah. have you changed through the process and what are you anticipating for the future for yourself? Um, so, so future, future wise, um, man, so this year I've been able to lock in on a lot of things that I've said I, I wanted to do. And, you know, <laughs> as time goes, it's like, oh man, here goes another year, here goes another year kind of thing. But this year I've, I've been able to kind of lock in and hold in and put into motion a lot of things that I would like to manifest, um, for a year and 10 years. So I'm able to, um, start building my the actual clothing line and not just have okay. uh, bow ties and pins and stuff like that, man. Like I'm actually bringing in merchandise uh, to where you can have pants, you can have shirts, you can have jackets, hats, beanies, since beanie season. So, you know, um, gotta bring all that stuff in. Cool. So basically what I would like to do is have a line that takes care of everything that the dapper guy needs. And I think my platform will be more so the everyday guy as opposed to just like events or just special occasions. Um, Cause everybody's not dressing up all the time. Like, you know, sometimes we're chilling. So how do I provide pieces where people feel like they look nice every day and not mm. just every once in a while when I need to dress up. So that's, that's really the vibe that I'm going for with the brand. And that's what I, that's what Dapper Dude is supposed to be in the first place. I kind of mm. got locked in and it was my fault uh, to being the tie guy, being the, the guy who wears the suits. But really, Dapper Dude is supposed to be the everyday guy, just or wow. everyday, just everyday fashion person, and not just events. So I think that's where I'm going with with the brand, to where it's, you, you know it's the everyday guy. I I am grateful for having the business because I've learned how to um, to deal with different people, different personalities. Um, and okay. in this type of business, you have to, like, there's a lot of different people coming in, coming, talking to you, reaching out to you, and you have to know how to speak to everyone on whatever level they are, whatever level I am. So I've learned how to listen better, um, so that I can be a better servant. Cause that's, that's what we are. Like we're serving people sure. and, uh, and we're sewing into, into people's lives based off of the talents that we have that we're given. So, um, I have learned how to be a better listener and a better, um, yeah, just, just a better listener. And, and I'm grateful for, for that. Um, that's, I think that was the hardest part because I'm not necessarily a customer service person. I'm like, this is what it is. You know, it's, it's easy. <laughs> you know, but I've had to, you know, back off of that 
and sure. say, okay, what are sure. you saying? You know, so I, I and I, I think that I will get better at doing that in the future. And I think that makes that makes a brand. Like if I can hear what you're saying, what you're asking for, and then how do I pro provide that based off of the things that I do? Um, I, I think that makes a big difference. No, that's that's exceptional. Um, not just in terms of how you presented it, but again, the place it's coming from. I think there's a customer service and customer experience component to virtually anything yep. a person does. Yeah. Um, and I think that, well, I know for me, I also can relate to sometimes you have a vision in your head and because it's so clear to mm -hmm. you, if there's anything that's competing yeah. with that, even if it's a customer, right, right, sometimes right. you're saying to yourself like, no, this is the line, right. but learning to listen, learning to be stretched really. I think that mm -hmm. as much of a brand that is as much of a brand, how do I wanna say this question? However much a brand is created by say you or by me, there's a significant amount of it that's also created by the customer, Yes. right? Mm -hmm. um, and so being malleable, you know, being flexible, I think we should have boundaries. I think that we should yeah. not, again, say, you know, 10 years from now, I don't know if, <laughs> if 10 years from now, the dapper dude is like a, a, a newborn baby's collection, then right. it's like, yeah. okay, it yeah. says, this is taking a turn, right? right. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> he yeah, might've yeah. been listening too much to the yeah. feedback. So you should have Absolutely. boundaries, right? Of, mm -hmm. of, of, so that you don't get taken a place where you don't want to go. But I right. also think that those boundaries might need to have at least a, a, a gate or some windows to let the mm -hmm. light of inspiration from your customers, from your clients. And yeah. because sometimes I've known, I've learned, man, some of the most powerful, you know, programs or activities have not stemmed from my own vision, but by that visioning being sharpened and honed yep. by the voices and the views of others. So I, I do appreciate that perspective. Um, I want to ask you this. Yeah. Let's say illustratively speaking, the Dapper Dude collection, which is right now a, a clothing brand and is expanding. And I do believe that it is going to um, get closer and closer to the vision you have and even beyond that. But let's say now people don't reach out to you just for the items. Mm -hmm. And they say, listen, we love the culture of the Dapper Dude. We appreciate the worldview that it's presenting. And we think that if the Dapper Dude worldview, if the Dapper Dude mindset could somehow be introduced to not just men, mm -hmm. but now boys yep. in a way that allows them to be able to chart a new course. Um, if the Dapper Dude becomes like this nonprofit, let's say, or, yeah. or something like that. Now I wanna compare it with this. When we think of James Bond, when people hear that name, there's a yeah. lot that comes with that. Absolutely. He's the clean, cool guy gets the girls, you know, beats the bad guys, right, right. you know, and, and lives to tell the story, right. all that, right? So James Bond has that with it. So if James Bond had an organization that was developing young men, the idea would be, well, when they become of age, they'll be James Bond-like. Mm -hmm. So now if there's a dapper dude program or something like that, what are these young brothers growing up to be? What values are they embracing and exemplifying as they grow into men what's the yeah. dapper dude effect who yeah that's that's a good that's a good loaded one too man um so personally speaking man it and i can i'll speak from what i'm trying to instill in my son um learn how to be a thinker and someone who asks questions and is okay with with how other people think as well um, and, and not being judgmental on, on a lot of things. So you're, you're open to, to be able to listen to everyone and understand and glean uh, knowledge from, from everyone. So that's, that's one thing, just kind of being open um, and learn how to be confident in who God made you mm -hmm. like off the bat. Like that, that goes so, so far because a lot of times we're trying to please everyone else. Um, if I can kind of help uh, my young guys understand that, hey, God made you who you are, and that's cool. You don't have to look outside of that. Ask God who you're supposed to be and walk in that line, and that's what you're supposed to be doing. Because um, a lot of times we come back to that point after being 30, 40, however, um, however old, we come back and we're like, yeah, I, I should have just stayed in that vein right there. <laughs> yes, yeah. Right? That's what I was supposed to be doing all this time. So... I, I would like to help our young guys learn how to 
listen for what God is telling you to do and walk in it and walk in it boldly. Um, and and just, just confidence, man. I, I want our guys to be confident in, 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 in our purpose. Sure. Yeah, I, I think that's what I, I like to instill, man. And, and yeah, it, it's not really, really huge, but that confidence is, is, is very huge, man. And I think that's something that's lacking and that we always end up having to come back and talk to somebody about, you know, why, what happened in my past that, that made me this way. And you, you got to get that confidence and walk in it, man. Yeah, because I... Sure, that... that Because no, go God, I mean, he, he didn't give us the spirit of fear, man. So I, I've always felt like if I am fearing things, then that's, I'm listening to the wrong spirit. So... Mm. So um, just instilling confidence and just the, the confidence of God is in, is in us all the time, man. So I, I think that's what I want to instill into my young guys. Now, listen, man, and this was another question for those listening that I didn't give him in advance. And so <laughs> that is not a prepared, you know, Word document answer. That's coming straight from the heart. And I think that we're living in a day and age where especially for young black boys who are becoming mm -hmm. young black men and who will become older black men, yep. um, our whole approach to life at times, if there's no one to come and intervene and show us, no, it's possible to be, to be a thoughtful, informed young man. It's possible to have confidence that is not stemming from fear. Um, we know personally, and even just based on what we observe, that there are a lot of us, a lot of our peers who operate mm -hmm. from a sense of fear, you know, rage, anger. And I'll be honest, that there's a lot to be, to have a healthy sense of fear about, right? There's a yes. lot going on in our community that is, that is fearful, it's frightening even. But yeah. how do I not allow that to penetrate my core and that becomes yeah. the place where I lead from, right? Yeah. So yeah. again, I don't know if this was ever on your mind, maybe I'm just planting seeds here. Hey. Um, it might not need to go and become, you know, start off like a big thing, but like you said, sometimes you kind of roll with the flow you know, who knows, just having, you know, dapper dude sessions where you get a bunch of young brothers together and just help them to kind of speak their own truth. Hey, what is your sense of style? Man, I like the LeBrons. I like this. Okay, why do you like that? Where's that coming from? If you couldn't get another pair of LeBrons, would you still play basketball? Do you think you'd right. be good? Right. And so developing that thoughtful and confident young man i mean those two things yeah. alone for me that created just a picture i would bring my son i don't have any kids yet but if i had a son yeah. him and i would be there like yo yeah. we're going to the dapper dude session you know we're going to walk away with some clean clothes or bow tie yeah. or something like that i'm going to invest in you son but also this is something that we are not only just clothing the outer man mm -hmm. but we're also clothing and shaping the inner man inner man yeah. as well mind heart yeah. spirit so, man, I appreciate that. And, and, I, and I think that that is, even if it's just your son, the world yeah. will be different because a young boy had a father who said, I want yeah. you to be confident. I want you to be a thinker. So that's profound. And, and listen, man, I, thank you for saying that, that. That's where it starts, man. It starts with our sons. Like, you got to start there first, teaching them. Um, like, my son, he doesn't want to have anything to do with fashion, right? Okay. <laughs> right? But I let him know, that's it. All I need you to do is be clean. Like, mm -hmm. as long as you're taking care of yourself and brush your teeth, take a shower and all that type of stuff, uh, we're good. You, if that's going to make you confident, he wants to wear sweats, cool, as long as you're clean. Um, and just be okay with being yourself, man. Awesome. Listen, where can people follow you, connect with you, invest in you? Let us know your social media handles, the website, and if they are ever in the greater Huntsville area, how people can connect with you in person. All right, man. So, um, man, Instagram is always the best place to reach me. Uh, I'm, I'm always posted on there. Um, and you can reach me at, at underscore dapper dude underscore. Um, the website is www.thedapperdudecollection.com. Um, and if you're in Huntsville, I'm downtown um, 101 Clinton Avenue East. Um, and that's Huntsville, Alabama, 35801, right on Clinton, um, across the street from Roosevelt and Co. And um, yeah, you can reach me at all those places, man. And I'd, I'd love to, to help out and serve. Awesome. Now, as we're preparing to close, I know we've had a great, vibrant conversation. It's kind of taken us left, right, up and down, and I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, so I just want to ask you this final question, man. Listen, if you had to give advice to the listeners about one color that needs to be within arm's reach this winter, 
What's that color? <laughs> oh man. Uh, man, that is a, a big question because I choose colors based off of how I'm feeling that day. Okay. So that's the only reason why it's hard for me to answer that question. Um, I'm, I'm kind of like a mood ring, man. Like just okay. however I'm feeling, like that's where I'm going. So I, I would say I'm, I'm, I'm good with a, a, a nice, just deep red. I don't mm. know, that's, that's, that was the first one that jumped out at me, a nice deep okay. red. Yeah. All right, there it is. Listen, folk, uh, take that to the bank. Get, get yourself a nice deep red item, whether it's a shirt, an accent, yep. an accessory rather. Uh, a beanie, a pair of socks, and who knows? Take a picture of it, send a DM to 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 Derek. Uh, Derek you know, spark up that dialogue. As you can see, he's a good brother with a good cause, Great. making inroads to his family and to both the national and an international audience. And brother, man, much respect to you. I'm not only praying for you to have much success, but I'll Thank be you. continuing to watch you. Um, and I appreciate just you spending some time together with us in the living room. Happy to do it, man. Thank you for having me. Thank you for the opportunity to ch uh, chat with you and, and get to know you better, man. And um, thank you very much. Not a problem. And thank you all so much for coming into the living room where we listen, learn, and live together. As I said at the beginning, if you do not feel as though you have a sense of style, you're not fashion forward, that's okay. This is not a comparison game. It's a comfort game. Be you, do what you do. Be clean, be confident, be thoughtful, be mindful. When you approach life, you don't have to be arrogant, conceited, letting people know how much money you're investing in this or that. The objective is, is not only to clothe the outside, but also to be making sure you're doing that work on the inside as well. Well, that's all we have for this episode of The Living Room. I'm your host, Richard Martin. Our special guest has been Mr. Derek Ramey Jr., Chief Designer, CEO, and Founder of the Dapper Dude Collection, which I know you're going to go invest in for yourself, for your brother, for your father, for your son, for your nephew. Hey, even for your next door neighbor, let's <laughs> pour in, let's support. Until next time, you all be well. Keep listening, keep learning, and keep living. We'll see you next time. <laughs>